Hello, I'm Dr. Malescu, and I am your AMP1 instructor for lab. So this is the lab section, and this is our first uh, lab session. And I am narrating the PowerPoints as we go along each week. You will notice it'll say narrated PowerPoint. Um, this will help you uh, prior to entering virtual classrooms so you know exactly what I'll be talking about. And so it'll be much easier to understand if you have reviewed this narrated version. So it's almost like you get your at-home instructor um, you know, narrated, and if you have questions, you can present it to me in virtual classrooms since we have to be online for now during this pandemic. Okay, so I'm putting my uh, speaker right next to my lips so you can hear me better. Um, let us begin. So the first um, topic of the day uh, that we will do in these PowerPoint slides is A, we're going to describe what anatomical position looks like. B, we will be talking about the anatomical planes. We are three-dimensional beings, so we have to define the three dimensions. Directional terms will also be described. Then we will be moving on to body regions. Uh, we have what's called quadrants and regions, and so we will discuss those. These are just parts of the body that we have names for. So this is pure anatomy, understanding and defining the terms um, so that when we start going into more detail, we all have the same lingo, the same language, and we know what we are referring to when we talk about anatomical position. Um, everyone knows that we are talking about a specific position. Um, and then we're going to just do a panoramic view of what AMP 1 and 2 will look like, which is basically a year of anatomy and physiology. Um, the organ systems is just going to be me showing you all the different uh, organ systems. And as we progress each week, we will go through each organ system. Uh, the first four weeks of anatomy and physiology one will not even get to organ systems because we will be talking mostly about not only language of anatomy, but we will be talking about how to use the microscope. We will be talking about microscopic anatomical features, uh, understanding from the chemical level, from the molecular level to the cellular level. So we'll be doing some cell biology and then moving on to tissue before we even get into the gross anatomy aspect where we will be discussing the first organ system, which will be integumentary system. After integumentary system, we will be talking about the function of bone, so the physiology of bone, and then the gross anatomy of the skeletal system, understanding the names that we have assigned for all the uh, bony landmarks on the skeletal system. So um, that will be week five, six, and seven. And week eight will be the midterm practical. After that, we will be going to the function of muscles, understanding muscle uh, contraction. And then from the physiological aspect of muscle contraction, we move to the gross anatomy where, again, you will have a lot of memorization and understanding the names of these muscles, which are Latin-based. So if you speak a Romance language, such as Romanian, Italian, French, Spanish, or Portuguese, um, these languages will help you because a lot of the names that you will see uh, for these muscles are Latin-based, and these are Latin-based languages, so they're very similar. Okay, so moving on from uh, naming all the muscles, you will also have to know the origin, insertion, and action for some of the main ones, but not all of them. There are over 600 muscles, but we will not be going over all of that in AMP1. It's just not enough time. We are introducing you to uh, the muscular system, but if you go on to physical therapy school or uh, massage school or PTA school or physical therapy beyond that to DPT, uh, doctor of physical therapy, um, those people really dive into deep. Um, for me, it was a lot of that as well because I became a podiatrist, a foot and ankle surgeon. So um, the musculoskeletal system was uh, in such detail. I even had a lower extremity anatomy for six months. All right. So it depends on the uh, individual where, what um, 
program they're going into. But for purposes of this course, you are simply just going to be learning the superficial, um, the most superficial muscles and maybe second layer, but never going down to deep layer. Moving on from um, muscles, we will be going over the nervous system and uh, that's a full three weeks right there and then it's pretty much the end of the course um, and you'll have your final practical um, after Thanksgiving. Okay, so that's pretty much what I just told you was um, everything that uh, you see here where it says organ systems. That's pretty much A and P1. Now, with respect to organ systems, what will you be doing in A and P2? Everything that we don't do in A and P1, right? So we'll be doing more physiology, so understanding the um, function of the endocrine system. So that'll be a whole... Um, week of just understanding all the glands and what they do. After that, we will be going over reproductive system and how that's related to endocrine. After that, we will be doing blood and then we will talk about uh, cardiac and blood vessels, arteries and veins, after which we will be talking about lymphatic system, immune system. After that, we will be doing respiratory, digestive system and urinary system. And that's A and P2. All right, so let's get you through AMP1. So without further ado, let's continue with these slides. Uh, let's see. Here we go. I have a touch screen, so if you see me stretching, that's what I'm doing. Okay, so uh, what is anatomical position? Anatomical position is this lady right here. Uh, let me move my little um, screencast image of me. There we are. So... What you are what you are seeing here is the palms are facing forward and this is the hands are supinated. The way I like to tell people is this. If your hands are up like this, soup, you're holding the soup, soups up, right? And then you bring your hands next to your body, that is going to be anatomical position. The minute you drop the soup and you turn it over, your hands go in this way where the palms are facing posterior or behind you, then that that is a, a pronated hand position. So when you're looking at anatomical position, you are looking at uh, a supinated hand, palms facing forward. Okay, so the subject is standing erect. Um, the feet are flat on the floor. The arms are at the side of the body. Okay, uh, the chin is parallel to the floor, so you don't have the chin down or looking up. All right, and um, like I said, the palms, the eyes, and the face are all facing forward, okay? And this is the standard frame of reference, okay? Uh, standard frame of reference for anatomical uh, description and dissection. Okay, so this is basically what I just described to you. I'm going to move my screencast right here so you can read what I was just describing. Subject stands erect, feet flat on the floor, arms at the sides, chin parallel to the floor, palms, eyes, and face facing forward, uh, facing the observer. This is the standard frame of reference, okay? All right, so now let's go on to the next slide, slide number three. We have 38 slides to go through. So um, I am quickly getting used to this technology so I can see that my screen recorder constantly has to move. So just give me one second so that I'm on the side here. This screencast recorder is recording my face as well as my voice as we're going through this PowerPoint. So I hope it's not too distracting. If it's distracting, just look at the PowerPoints and hear my voice. That's it. Okay, so here's the thing. Um, when we talk about the anatomical planes, I always, if you want to look at my image now, this would be the right time. Otherwise, I say don't look at me because <laughs> I am distracting you from the PowerPoint, right? The first thing I want to show you is, and I want you to practice this at home, is if you have a piece of paper, go ahead and divide your body right at the nose, okay? So right here at the nose. Do you all see me? I'm sure you do. Okay, so this is a mid-sagittal. All right, so now watch. The ear, okay, as opposed to my eye. The frame of reference is the mid-sagittal. So I'm going to tell you that these are the positional movements that I, uh, the positional um, anatomy that we need to understand. This is the mid-sagittal. 
the term that we use when something, a body part, is further away from the mid-sagittal. The term that we use is lateral. The term that we use when something is closest to this mid-sagittal, we say medial. Okay, so let's teach this properly. My ear is further away from the mid-sagittal, which is this piece of paper right here cutting my body in an equal left and right half, correct? So therefore, I can only assume that my ear, the term we use, is lateral as opposed to my eye. My eye is medial to the ear, but the ear is lateral to my eye. And all of this is based on the frame of reference, the mid-sagittal plane. Okay? So that was the description of mid-sagittal, where we talk about an equal left and right half. Okay? Now, let's move on to parasagittal. What is parasagittal? Parasagittal, you'll probably experience parasagittal if you become a uh, a radiology technician and you're doing CAT scans and MRIs and you're doing one millimeter cuts, 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 cuts all the way laterally. So starting from the mid sagittal and cutting laterally, laterally, laterally. Okay, going both sides, left and right. Okay, so um, for anatomy, we don't really talk about this that much uh, in reference to uh, what we do, uh, other than maybe if you want to dissect, uh, when we dissect the brain, we are always going to dissect the brain in an equal left hemisphere and right hemisphere. If you're doing a parasagittal cut, you're really... Um, <laughs> you're hacking, you're doing a hack job uh, on the dissection, okay? All right, so we have just finished uh, mid-sagittal. We talked about parasagittal. Now we will go on to frontal. Now let me delineate the difference between frontal and coronal. What's the difference? Nothing. It's positional, okay? It is a synonym. Coronal is a synonym for frontal. And basically, from the shoulder up, the head is, is basically coronal. But if I come down with this plane... All right, everything below the head is called frontal. It's kind of like when you have a street, and it's the same street that you're driving on. And all of a sudden, you look at the street name, and it's already changed to another name. It's the same road, but the name has changed. Basically, the analogy is the same here. Okay, so if I'm standing up, here I am standing up, okay, and here's my body. I have an equal front half and an equal back half, okay? So if I have this piece of paper, I am cutting the body in an anterior section and a posterior section. What do we mean by that? Everything in front of this paper, that means my belly, right? My chest cavity, my abdomen, and my pelvis. All of that right here in the front is anterior. Everything posterior, to this frontal is my backside, right? My upper back, my lower back, buttocks, hamstrings, all that, okay? So that's frontal. But now, if I sit down, okay, and I turn around in profile, and here's my head, everything in front, including my glasses, my nose, my face, that's anterior, and everything behind it is posterior. But when we uh, reference that plane, we don't say frontal, we say coronal, and that's pretty much it. Okay, so I hope that is clear to you now. So we went over mid-sagittal, we went over parasagittal, and now we went over frontal when it's below the head, and then at the head it's called coronal. And frontal um, defines everything in the front is called anterior, and everything in the back is posterior. Now, take good notes right now, if you're listening, because there's a synonym, and people get confused, but it means the same thing. Okay, so... Let's take a look at a dolphin. Why am I talking about a dolphin when I'm teaching human anatomy? Okay, so a dolphin has a dorsal fin, does it not? It has a curved fin as opposed to that weird shark fin. Trust me, I know the difference. <laughs> um, I live at New Smyrna Beach, and I can see those sharks, and I know the difference between a shark and a 
uh, dorsal fin of a dolphin. Now, if you look at a shark or at a dolphin, the dorsal side with the dorsal fin is the back side, posterior. The ventral side, the belly of the shark or the dolphin, is the anterior side, and that anterior side is also called ventral. So, ergo, I want to tell you that we have um, basically synonyms. So when I'm describing to you anterior, your mind should also refer to anterior or ventral. And when I describe posterior, your mind should automatically also go to, okay, posterior, the same name for it would be dorsal. So anterior is ventral and posterior is dorsal. And how do you remember it? Remember the shark or the dolphin, whichever animal you prefer. You have the dorsal fin, that's the back side. The front side, the belly side of the fish is anterior or ventral. Okay, so we move away from that and move on to horizontal. Horizontal, I'm going to stand up. And here you can see I cut the body into a superior and an inferior. So if you have your belly button here, Okay, your umbilicus. Okay, that's what we have. The medical name, uh, the anatomical name for the belly button is called the umbilicus. Right here is my umbilicus. Okay, so I'm doing a transverse cut right at the umbilicus. Okay, so everything, it's a transverse cut across the torso. Everything above the torso, right here, okay, that is superior. Everything below the torso okay, is inferior, okay, inferior and superior, okay, so please make sure that you go over those terms and know them very well, because, um, well, it, it will haunt you and everything, whether you're going to be a surgeon or uh, just a simple uh, radiology tech who is setting a patient up for the MRI machine, you need to understand these cuts and know the body planes because that is the essence of everything in, in medicine. Uh, especially if you're going to be a PA or a nurse, you have to know this terminology. You have to, have to, have to, have to. Okay, so oblique we don't really discuss in anatomy, um, but definitely if you're making an incision in surgery, an oblique incision just means diagonal. Okay, the, the body plane is cut from at a slant, okay, and it's not perpendicular. And that's pretty much it with that. So um, let me continue as I continue to the next slide. So um, let's just do a quick test. So um, some of you right now, I'm going to pause and ask you, what plane is this? So if you're watching this video, uh, based on what I have told you, I gave you only three options. So you have a one out of three chances to get this correct. So we talked about uh, mid-sagittal plane. We talked about transverse plane. And we talked about frontal plane. Now, let me uh, elucidate as to what we are viewing here. This is the female reproductive system, and we are looking at the female pelvic cavity. And if you see here, this is the ovary. I might as well go over it because you're going to have to learn it anyway. So this is the ovary. These are uh, the fimbriae, the finger-like projections that receive the egg once a month during ovulation. This here is the... Um, uterine uh, tube, also called the fallopian tube. This here is the um, uterus. Right here is the cervix. This is the vagina. Okay, anterior to the vaginal opening is the urethra. So notice the urethra is quite short. And this is the urinary bladder. This is the clitoris. Okay, and then back here, this is your rectum and um, the anus. And then, of course, um, going up, you've got the sigmoid, um, Anyway, it's, it's just, we'll go over that when we get to digestive system. Okay, so I kind of wasted some time for you to think about what am I looking at. So if you look at it, this looks like a profile view. So if it's a profile view, I'm going to stand up, go ahead and look at my image. If it's a profile view, can it be transverse? No, it cannot be transverse. Can it be frontal? No, it cannot be frontal. That makes no sense. 
does it. Okay, now can it be sagittal? If I cut the body in half, cut the body mid-sagittal, and you're looking on the inside, this is what you are going to see. Okay, so therefore the answer to this one is that we are looking at a mid-sagittal cut of the female reproductive system. All right, I'm going to keep going. So I wanted to show you this because I said very specific mid-sagittal. When we're doing anatomy, we're never going to do parasagittal. We want to cut the body in an equal uh, half, okay? So when I when we type out in a PowerPoint slide and you see the sagittal, know that that's what it means, okay? It, we're referring to the mid-sagittal plane, unless otherwise noted. So if I say parasagittal, you'll know. But otherwise, you'll always know that when we cut the body in half, it's going to be sagittal. You could add the mid-sagittal for purposes of completion, but um, not necessary. And on the test, if I ask you questions, it's, it, it won't be mid-sagittal. Okay, if it is, even better, but most likely it'll just be sagittal. Save some wording. You'll know. Sagittal means we're cutting the body in an equal left and right half. All right, slide number five out of 38. Here we go. So, let's test you on this one. I'm going to give you whole let's see five seconds to tell me what this is so again if I cut the body mid sagittal are you going to see it this way if I cut the body frontal are you going to see this or if I cut the body transverse are you going to see this what is it that we're looking at well we're looking at the thoracic cavity the thoracic cavity is a larger cavity inside it's your chest cavity layman term but your thoracic cavity is an all-inclusive cavity that includes your left lung your right lung so left and right lung and your heart and all the structures behind it now when we go over cavities you will see uh, bottom line you will see that we not only discuss the uh, thoracic cavity but we'll say we'll break it down even further into left plural right plural pericardium and then everything in the middle the structures behind the heart such as the aorta the esophagus things like that um, those structures are part of the mediastinum. I like to tell people medial or middle. It's basically right there. Your heart is dead middle, but everything behind it truly is middle, so we say mediastinum. What divides the thoracic cavity from the abdomen or the abdominal cavity is this smooth muscle right here called the diaphragm. The diaphragm drops when you inhale and your lungs expand as your uh, diaphragm drops. That's for another day when we discuss respiratory system in AMP2. Okay, so um, now that I've discussed all that, tell me, what do you think this is? Well, according to the planes, there's only three answers that you can give me, but only one is correct. It is not, it is not sagittal, it is not transverse, this is a frontal view. Oh boy, I have to cough, but I don't want to cough into the speaker. Pardon me. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me drink some water. This is what happens when we discuss and talk. <laughs> Coffee talk. I do have that as well. There it is. All right. <laughs> Try to keep this uh, video short, but I also have to take a little break. Very annoying. I'm sure you can hear me swallowing. All right, here we go. <clears throat> so, let's move on. This is the frontal section. As I said, there is the answer. I'm going to move on to the next slide now. And now we look at a bird's eye view of a brain. So let's show you that. Voila. So this is a true transverse cut. I'm not even going to wait for you to answer because it's pretty damn easy. If you take the top skull off, the top of your skull off, cross section just like this, right? 
transverse straight across all the way around, right? Take the top off, and I'm looking at it from the top, from the superior aspect, okay? I'm standing over your head. I took the skull off, and I'm doing a bird's eye view of that brain. So that would be what? Transverse plane, okay? So there it is. Let me go on, and your answer is right there, transverse section. All right, so now I'm going to fill this out right here. Let's see. So this is just another test to ask you what cut or what plane is this. This is the male reproductive system um, in the pelvic region, but when you look up higher over here, you're looking at the abdominal cavity. Uh, the diaphragm is separating the thoracic from the abdominal cavity. So you can see the abdominal cavity is a vast area, and look how huge the liver is. All right, and then here you can see that it's a male because there's the penis. Um, you have the uh, testicles with the scrotum. Um, and then, of course, um, you're looking at the vertebral column with the intervertebral discs in between the vertebrae. Okay, so this, is, this should be very intuitive, very easy. It's an equal cut midsection between the left side of the body and the right side of the body. So we look at the body in profile. So whenever you're looking at the body in profile, we are looking at a mid-sagittal or sagittal plane. All right. Now, let's look at this next one. Now we are looking at a torso. Okay. We are looking at what level? Well, it tells you right here. I'm going to use my arrow to show you. We are at L2. So if you must know, I'm going to stand up and tell you where L2 is. So you see where your rib cage is? Follow the rib cage right there and go one, two spinous processes. And when you go two spinous processes below your rib cage, you are at L2. Okay, so that's the level we're at. So we're still pretty high up because kidneys, contrary to what people think, the kidneys are literally um, just, just like part of the kidneys are actually the rib cage is protecting. All right, and then right below the rib cage posteriorly, you can see the, the kidneys. This is why they tell you in boxing, you're never supposed to hit up there, upper back. No way, Jose, never, because that's how you can really damage someone. Okay. So this is the uh, 95 South, as I like to affectionately call it, because it is heading south from the heart, heading south all the way, branches, branches, branch, 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 branch. It branches out into secondary and tertiary uh, arteries to arterioles to capillaries, and then the capillaries go to the venules, and the veins bring the blood back to the heart. So 95 North is the inferior vena cava bringing the blood back to the heart. And then 95 South, um, <laughs> this is not literal, but I'm just saying, it's like the highway that goes north and south, right? So 95 South, this is the aorta, and it, it brings oxygenated blood to the rest of the body as it departs in from the heart, from the left side of the heart via the aortic arch, and it continues descending down very, very deep. Thankfully, it's deep, right? You don't want it superficial. And on skinny people, when they're laying down, you can actually feel their pulse, all right, on heavier set people, you really can't because it, it, it's just the, the fat kind of, you can't feel it. All right, but when you palpate the abdomen on a, on a skinny person, you can actually dig your fingers deep. Uh, not comfortable, trust me. But when we used to have to do abdominal um, examinations, um, I, would, I would feel the aorta. And you could feel uh, an abnormal uh, aorta if it's a bounding pulse. Bounding pulse, that's usually an enlargement, um, which we call an aneurysm, which is literally a ticking time bomb. If your aneurysm uh, ruptures uh, in the aorta, you've got less than four minutes to die. So um, uh, I think the, I don't, not sure about the percentage, but it's really low uh, in terms of the percentage of survival after an aortic um, rupture. Uh, the famous actor John Ritter uh, had, uh, had this in his 50s. He died suddenly. 
Okay, so I gave you a lot more information that you need to know, but I tend to go off on tangents because it's, you know, anatomy, and it's my passion. It's interesting. I love it. All right, and so ask me about what these blue lines are. These are the membranes, and we're going to talk about that in this, in this lesson. All right, let's keep going because I'm only 8 out of 38 slides, and i got to get through this. i got to get through this. And we are at 30 minutes. All right, quadrants. So we're finished. We're finished with the body planes. Let's move on to quadrants. Quadrants are basically delineating the body um, in four quadrants. Um, and what part of the body? We're just looking at the trunk, the main portion of the body. So um, if you look at the green here, this is the right upper quadrant, because remember, it's the patient's right side, okay? I know this looks to you as a left when you're looking at it, okay, but you got to think mirror image, and I, <laughs> I happen to teach Pilates and yoga, so when I'm in front of a camera, when I'm stretching over to the left, I'm actually turning over to the right. So, for example, if I'm turning over to the right, and I'm telling you to turn over to the right, my body is turning to the left because it's a mirror image. So I want you to really understand that because um, <laughs> uh, I've seen that medical students and nurses make that mistake, especially when it comes to the stethoscope as to where we're going to position things. And we don't want to look stupid, <laughs> um, especially with the quadrants. You, you don't want to be putting the stethoscope in the wrong spot listening to bowel sounds. Okay, so... Uh, right upper quadrant is the patient's right side right here. Left upper quadrant is the patient's left side. Right lower quadrant is seen here in pink. Left lower quadrant is seen here on the uh, right, uh, blah, 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 blah. on the patient's left, you looking at it from the right side. Okay, so what is in? Let's just take a sneak peek before we even look. If you palpate the right upper quadrant, you if if you know a little bit about your body, um, but I'll tell you, you know what you know what's over there, <laughs> the gallbladder and the liver is over there. So if you have right upper quadrant pain, you might have a gallstone or you might have something going on with the liver. Okay, so that's that. So the liver, by the way, is what produces the bile, which is basically an emulsifier, kind of like detergent, and it breaks down heavy fats, like thick, thick molecular linkages of saturated and unsaturated fats. So someone who has gallstones might have had a very poor diet, high in fat, um, or sometimes it, it's not the diet. Sometimes it's just, you know, that's it. The body just says, no more. I can't process the fat. And uh, you may not be eating too much fat, but it's just that's just the way it goes. All right, so that is the right upper quadrant. Now let's look at the uh, right lower quadrant. Well, the right lower quadrant, you're going to have the ascending colon. Going across, you have the transverse colon and descending colon, sigmoid rectum anus. Okay, so what am I talking about? I'm talking about the large intestine. So yes, part of the large intestine will be here. But before you get to the large intestine, you also have to recall that the appendix is here. You also have to recall that if the if the uh, patient is a female, um, it, this is this is this consists of the, the pelvic cavity. And so um, in the pelvic cavity, right above this iliac crest right here, right about around here is uh, the person's ovary if it's a female. So it could be uh, an ovarian cyst. It could be torsion of the order ovary where the uterine tube twists and strangulates and cuts off the blood supply. Extremely excruciatingly painful. It very much mimics very much mimics uh, an appendicitis. All right, so that is the uh, right lower quadrant. What about over here? We're looking at the uh, left upper quadrant. Well, in the left upper quadrant, we have the spleen, we have the stomach. Um, we have retroperitoneal. What does that mean? Peritoneum is the tissue, the uh, connective tissue, the lining. Um, and then it, when we talk about um, 
organs that are behind this peritoneum, we say retroperitoneal. So basically, your pancreas is very posterior. It's behind the stomach. It's retroperitoneal behind that tissue. Um, so the pancreas is also located there. And the pancreas is a gland. And it's an exocrine gland and an endocrine gland. Exocrine because it has a duct and it releases uh, digestive juices. Um, and it also um, increases the pH uh, to, to lower the acidity level. Um, and then, of course, it also acts as an endocrine gland because uh, it releases two hormones. You're going to learn about this in endocrine system, but basically uh, insulin. Um, as well as glucagon. So insulin, when your body has just eaten and you're full, you feel full and you got plenty of glucose that needs to be uh, mobilized to your cellular uh, uh, parts, all the cells of the body are going to need the glucose. So it travels through your uh, arteries and then finally arterioles and capillaries. And this is how it gets transferred over eventually to the cells. And the cells have these uh, insulin receptors. And insulin is going to assist the absorption of the glucose inside uh, across that membrane. Uh, and of course, we're going to talk about membrane transport in uh, week two. Uh, when we talk about uh, cell biology. So I'm going off on a tangent again. I apologize. But <laughs> but that's, uh, you know, neither here nor there. I just wanted to let you know a little bit about what the pancreas does. And, you know, it's going to come back because you're going to be like, oh, yeah, that's right. First day she talked about it in anatomy. You're going to learn about insulin, okay? And I, I like to talk about it because <laughs> greater than 40% of our population is obese. And so most of, not most, but a lot of the um, people that become uh, obese also become uh, diabetic, all right? Now, glucagon is when you're hungry and your blood glucose is less than 50 and your brain, you're hangry, right? And your brain is like, eh, that's the first thing. The brain needs glucose. So um, glucagon is released from the pancreas and then the pancreas, uh, as it releases um, this glucagon, it goes to, guess what? Your liver, which is located in your right upper quadrant. And your liver is going to break down the glucose storage, which is called glycogen. And now we have free, free glucose molecules circulating uh, in your circulation, reaching uh, vast parts of the body so that you're not passing out, especially the brain. Okay, so I told you more than you need to know, but basically what's over here um, in your left upper quadrant, as I said, the spleen, the stomach, the pancreas, you've got parts of the small intestine as well. All right, so what about, I told you already, the right lower quadrant, left lower quadrant is mainly going to be your small intestine and large intestine. All right, I beat that to the ground, so let's keep going. We are now 40 minutes into this, 37 exactly. I'm keeping track of time. So um, this is just me filling in the names I got an itch, and I don't want this to, you're probably going to still hear me scratching. <laughs> okay. All right. So those are all the quadrants. Let's keep going. Now, we discussed the quadrants. We move on to the regions. So regions are a little bit more detailed. Um, so quadrants was cut in four. So if you create a cross and it, the cross is right in the middle where the umbilicus is, you've got the quadrants. Regions is a little bit more detail. So with regions, you've got, let me put the names in. I'm going to put all the names in so you could learn these. So these are terms that you need to learn. I think I got everything. Yes. Okay, so um, both uh, turquoise blue here, that's called the hypochondriac uh, region. Um, there's a reason for that <laughs> because, um, you know, I guess if they rule out all kinds of issues, um, somebody's coming in for pain meds <laughs> and um, there's absolutely not much going on there if there's no uh, fractured ribs, <laughs> um, they call it the hypochondriac region. 
All right, so there's the uh, right hypochondriac region, and there's the left hypochondriac region. Now, remember, your belly button is called the umbilicus. This whole pink region is the umbilicus. Everything above the umbilical region is the epi, meaning epi means on top, gastric means stomach. So epi means it's above the umbilical region and gastric means it's the stomach. So you can see mainly a lot of the stomach is here. You also have parts of the liver. You could probably see the liver sticking out over here. Okay, so that's the epigastric region, the right hypochondriac region, left hypochondriac region, epigastric region, umbilical region. Now let me explain to you lumbar region and I'm going to stand up because it's easier this way. So if I place my hands on my lower back, okay, so here are my hands on the lower back, okay, and I turn around and this is where it's at. Okay, so if you feel the arch of your back, okay, the lumbar region of your back, place your hands there, flip it forward, okay and that's the lumbar region okay it is also <laughs> probably a great analogy for you to remember where this uh, lumbar region is the iliac crest is right here that's part of the hip bone and we're going to learn that in a skeletal system but everything above that if if you start gaining weight the, that would be um, what they affectionately call the uh, love handles. <laughs> okay. Now, inguinal region has many names. They also call it the iliac region. So you may see it in other books as iliac region or inguinal region. Okay. Or basically the layman term is that it is the groin. Okay. So that's the groin. Now, Hypogastric means it's below, below the stomach, below the umbilical. So hypo means below, hypogastric region. Okay, so that would include, if you look over here on this PowerPoint slide, it includes the urinary bladder and the urethra. Okay, let's keep going. Sorry for the pause. I'm just trying to get everything up here. Okay, so we are looking at the uh, dorsal cavity. And the dorsal cavity is everything. Let me move my nail over here because it distracts me. Okay, come on, you can do it. All right, so the dorsal cavity, also known as posterior. Please remember this. This is often a question on many exams, whether it's a quiz or a test exam. Um, please know this, that the dorsal cavity includes the cranial cavity and the vertebral canal. I repeat, the dorsal cavity includes the cranial cavity and the vertebral canal. What's in the cranial cavity? The brain. What's in the vertebral canal? <laughs> the spinal cord, okay? All right, so brain and spinal cord, and we will be doing uh, CNS. CNS is the brain and the spinal cord. PNS, peripheral nervous system, is going to be the nerves, the cranial nerves and the spinal nerves. There'll be spinal nerves coming off of the spinal cord. Okay, now look at the chest cavity. We call that the thoracic cavity, right? The diaphragm delineates the, or separates out the thoracic cavity from the abdominal pelvic. Um, we can separate out the abdominal pelvic to either just the abdominal cavity and the pelvic cavity. <clears throat> okay, so that's what you see here, abdominal cavity and pelvic cavity. All right, let's keep going. So in this slide, let me move my thumbnail again to up here so it's away. 
slowly getting used to using this screencast. Um, it's fun to use, but there is definitely uh, a learning curve. And this is one of my first videos, so I apologize if I'm a little slow. Okay, one more thing. There it is. Okay, so now we are finished discussing <laughs> the regions and all that. I'm going to move this over here so you can see better. Okay. So we talked about the dorsal cavity, right, which, in, which we discussed in the last slide. We talked about the thoracic cavity, but now we divide the thoracic cavity even further. Okay, so this region that we're talking about, the thoracic cavity, includes um, everything you need to know inside of it. So on the left side, we have the left lung that is housed inside what's called it, it's inside what's called the pleural cavity, left pleural cavity. Now, the right lung is housed in the right pleural cavity. And that blue line that you see there uh, surrounding the lungs, that would be the lining along the uh, pleural cavity. And that lining along the pleural cavity is called parietal pleura. Now, that lining is a connective tissue, and if it's lining the wall of a cavity, it'll always be termed parietal. If a connective tissue, otherwise known as a lining, covers an organ, that would be deeper. So when something is deep, it's visceral, right? Oh, that hit me so viscerally, meaning pain. Well, the term that we use for the lining on an organ is called visceral. So in this case, because we're looking at lungs, this would be visceral pleura that covers the lung, and parietal pleura is a lining that covers the pleural cavity. And you see that both in the cavity and the right pleural cavity. You have the uh, right parietal pleura, okay, and then you have the left parietal pleura. Okay, so what about this purple area? This inside is the heart. Inside is the heart that is surrounded by the pericardial cavity. Now, the lining that covers the pericardial cavity is called parietal, because remember, parietal is superficial, is deep. So guess what we call it? We call it the parietal pericardium. And then with the heart, on top of that heart, we have visceral pericardium. So the visceral pericardium is the connective tissue lining that covers the heart. And it's also uh, analogous with what I will describe to you if any of you eat peanuts. Hopefully you're not allergic to them, but if you are, you might have opened one. Well, probably not because then you, if you're so allergic you can't even touch it. But if you open up the hard shell and you look at the inside seeds, there is another inner shell that is very thin and it's, it's fragile. Okay, and it breaks. But then if you open that up, you find the seed, which is the peanut. Okay, well, it's the same analogy. The outermost shell is the parietal pericardium, and it lines the actual cavity. Then you have the heart. I actually have a picture here of the heart, I think. All right, look at this. Here's the heart. Actually, let me do this. All right, now there's a lining right on top of the heart. So the lining right on top of the heart, and you can see, I'm going to move up right there, that's the lining, okay? That is called the visceral because it's deep and it's directly on the heart. So visceral pericardium, okay? Hopefully that helped. Now, what about the abdominal cavity? The abdominal cavity also has a lining, and so we also call it the pericard, uh, the sorry, parietal and visceral, same thing. And um, we're going to go over that in a minute because it's a different name. Um, we don't say pericardium. We say peritoneum. So peritoneum is spelled P-E-R-I, so peritoneum, T-O-N-E-U-M. Okay, and then down here is the pelvic cavity. So these are all the cavities that you have to know. It's not that bad. All right, that's pretty much it. So let's keep going. 
In this image, we are looking at the deep and superficial aspects of the heart. So what are we looking at here? Well, I'll tell you. In this blown up image of this section of the heart right here, we are looking at the outermost layer that covers the cavity. Okay, so what covers the cavity is parietal pericardium. Now, the innermost layer um, that is connective tissue is going to connect directly to this, to this uh, cardiac muscle right here. Okay, so this is cardiac muscle right here, and it's obviously very deep because this is the inner chamber. And if we're looking over here, this is probably the left atrium, which you'll learn when you get to AMP2. So this is the, the visceral pericardium because it is a thin membranous layer directly on top of the smooth, uh, I'm sorry, not smooth, uh, directly on top of the cardiac muscle. Okay, cardiac muscle, by the way, is involuntary. Thank God we don't have to think about our heart beating. Okay, it is a striated kind of muscle. It is involuntary. And um, that's pretty much the heart. Um, we're going to go into way more detail when we get there in AMP2. So let me elaborate and see the purple line around the heart. That beautiful purple line that's drawn out, okay, is supposed to represent the visceral pericardium. And then the pericardial space, or the pericardial cavity, all right? And then, of course, you can see here the turquoise blue represents the lining that covers the uh, pericardial cavity, so that would be the parietal pericardium. All right, so now we move on to the lungs, and we're going to take a deeper look here at visceral versus uh, parietal. Now, in the lungs, we don't say pericardium, we say pleura. So um, the left pleural cavity and the, and the right pleural cavity is what we're looking at. So this is the left pleural cavity and this is the right pleural cavity. Inside the left pleural cavity is the left lung, and inside the right uh, pleural cavity is the right lung. Now let me show you something right here. I'm going to show you when you get to respiratory system in AMP2, look at this. The left lung is bilobe. Do you see that? But the right lung has three lobes. All right, just so you know. All right, trivia, you need to know that. Try, rye, that's how I remember. Right side, try, try, rye, it rhymes. When I was in medical school, that's how I remembered it. So you have three lobes on the right side, two lobes on the left. Now, no one wants lung cancer, but if you ever had lung cancer, honestly, if you had to get a lobe removed because of cancer, I'm sure you would rather have cancer in the right versus the left. Just saying, because there's three lobes. Okay, so the lining that covers the lung is deep. Deep means visceral, so therefore this is called the visceral pleura. This is the pleural cavity. And then the lining along the pleural cavity is called the parietal pleura right here, that outer turquoise color right here. All right, and don't forget that when we look at the uh, diaphragm, it is a smooth muscle that delineates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. All right, so... Um, Let's see, we went over some of this, but I'm going to quickly fly through it now because it should be easy after really, really spending a lot of time in the beginning of this PowerPoint talking about superior, inferior, all that. But I will still stand up and review specific things with you. Okay, so superior, inferior. If we take the body in half, so everything um, from the umbilicus, I can't talk, umbilicus, everything above is superior, everything above that transverse cut, and then everything below the umbilicus, okay, that would be inferior. Then we had anterior, uh, posterior or ventral dorsal, and we did this to the body, right? So up at the top, it's coronal. Up at the bottom, it's frontal. And so we have the references based on the frontal plane. So anterior and ventral, posterior and dorsal, these are synonyms, and they are referenced by which plane? The frontal plane, uh, and then superiorly towards the head, which we say uh, cephalic. Cephalic means towards the head. Caudal means towards the tail. So if we're heading cephalic, at the top, 
superiorly or cephalic is going to we're going to say that it it's it's the cor uh, coronal plane that we are referencing when we are talking about anterior posterior versus um, ventral dorsal it means the same thing as I delineated before regarding um, the analogy uh, with the animals such as the dolphin and the shark. Okay, medial and lateral had to do with the mid-sagittal section and you had everything that's away from the mid-sagittal was lateral and everything towards the mid-sagittal was medial. Proximal distal, this is what I need to go over now. So here I go. Um, don't laugh, but I'm going to draw on my hand. I don't know if you can see it. But here's my hand. Um, I'm going to use my forearm. So this is from here to my wrist. Okay, so I'm going to put one, and I'm going to put, I don't know if you can see this, two. So if I'm going in this direction, I have an arrow. Okay? So one is up here, two is down here. This direction going towards the wrist that's heading distal. Got it? Then this direction heading towards my elbow, okay, there's my elbow, that's going proximal. I hope that helped. <laughs> and we reference incisions in surgery based on proximal and distal and medial and lateral. So when someone has an incision, it could start out at the proximal end and go diagonally from the proximal lateral to distal medial. All right, so that's how you would describe that. Now, moving on, we have ipsilateral and contralateral. Ipsilateral means same side. So let me stand up again. If I'm lifting my uh, right hand up and my left knee up, okay, then we're talking uh, ipsilateral. If I'm lifting my right hand up and my left leg up like this, then we're talking contralateral, okay? Uh, so that's ipsilateral and contralateral. Superficial versus deep, that is very intuitive. You should know that, right? So a superficial cut does not need any sutures. A deep cut moves beyond skin into the subcutaneous area. We have the epidermis, dermis, and the hypodermis. So a deep incision into the hypodermis, um, that would be considered deep. A superficial incision is just hitting the epidermis, which is the outer layer of the skin that has dead tissue, keratin. Um, we'll go over that when we do integumentary system. Okay, now let's talk about parietal versus visceral. So parietal we talked about is the lining that covers the um, lining that covers the cavity. Visceral is the lining that covers the actual organ. Okay, so I hope that helps you remember. Um, cephalic means towards the head, caudal means towards the tail. Okay, so again, towards the tail is down towards my sacrum, okay, and then towards the head is cephalic, okay? All right, so let's keep going. This terminology, there's no uh, way about it. You're just going to have to memorize it. Okay, so let me move my thumbnail over here. Uh, cephalic is towards the head. Otic means ear. Oral is mouth. Orbital is eye. Buccal means cheek. Mental means chin. Okay. Uh, think about the thinking man. That is a specific uh, statue, if you ever look at that. Glabella is forehead. I always think of like aliens with big foreheads. That's glabella, and the glabella sounds like a very strange name. Cervical is neck, but right below cervical is the nape of the neck or nuchal. And then we get to the shoulders. We call that the acromial region because there is a portion of the scapula that has a bony prominence that, that goes anteriorly. 
or ventrally and faces forward and it's right above that humerus so we call that the acromion and so the acromial region is pretty much um, right adjacent to your uh, arm socket which is the humerus and the glenoid cavity which you'll learn when you get to skeletal system axillary think about axe deodorant spray axe axillary armpit right brachial is arm okay Olecranol is the elbow, but then the front portion, okay, the front portion is antecubital. And then if we talked about brachial as being the arm, antebrachial is the forearm. So uh, brachial, okay, antecubital, all right, and then antebrachial. So brachial, antecubital, antebrachial. If I bend my elbow, this is olecranol. Okay, now the carpals are the wrist. The carpals are the wrist bones and they're located right in here. Uh, let's see if you can see this. All right, so carpal bones are going to be right in here. When you look at a hand, these are the metacarpals. Okay, these are the metacarpals. And then if you look even further, the thumb is called the pollux. Okay, and the phalanges are the digits. The thumb only has a proximal and distal phalanx, but the fingers, two, three, four, and five, both in hands and feet, have three phalanges, a proximal phalange, a middle phalange, and a distal phalange. And that goes for fingers two, three, four, and five, as well as toes two, three, four, and five. Now, what's the difference between the pollux and the hallux? Not much difference. We just have a different name. Hallux is the big toe. Pollux is the thumb. Palm or palmer. Mammary is breast. Umbilical is your belly button. Inguinal, okay. Inguinal iliac is the groin. Lumbar is your lower back. Glutes, everyone knows about glutes because we all want strong glutes, right? Or that bubble butt. <laughs> so we, no one likes a flat gluteus maximus. But that's the gluteal region is the buttocks. Behind the knee is called popliteal. That's misspelled. I apologize. It's P-O-P-L. Popliteal. P-O-P-L-I-T-E-A-L. -E now, depending on what region of the country you are from, in New York, I used to say popliteal. Down here, I hear popliteal. So I don't care which term you use as long as you can uh, remember that it is the back of the knee. The front of the knee or kneecap is called the patella. The uh, posterior leg where your calf muscles are, the gastrocnemius and um, soleus muscle together, gastrocnemius complex. That region, the posterior leg, is called sural. And then the lower, lower anterior leg, your shin bone. Oops, let me go back. Sorry, didn't mean to do that. Um, you see some naked people. <laughs> and that, it's anatomy. Of course, you're going to see that. Um, then we have uh, what's called the uh, crural, which is the anterior leg. Uh, which is the shin, and it is quite painful when, when you get hit in the shin. The ankle region is the tarsal region, which also includes right below um, the talus bone, which is the first part um, of the rear foot. The, the bone below that is called the calcaneus or your heel bone. Then you have the mid bones called the tarsals, and then just like in the hands, you have the metatarsal versus metacarpal, so don't get that confused. Um, so in the hands, you have the metacarpals. In the feet, you have the metatarsals. And then, of course, you have the big toe. is called the hallux. All right, so this terminology, you need to put it on an index card. You need to upload it into your brain, uh, or should I say download it, <laughs> and make sure you know it, okay? Because this, this is going to always haunt you. Um, you'll learn this in medical terminology. You'll, you'll learn this in nursing school, uh, chiropractic school, podiatry school, any kind of school. You, you have to know this. It's, it's doctor lingo. We need to know the body parts. Okay, so um, I'm not going to belabor this point because these terms are referencing now on the human body, on a uh, female body and on a male body. So you could look at this yourself. I'm going to keep going um, so that I don't get banned on YouTube. Here we go.
<laughs> okay, so we are coming towards the end of our PowerPoint because I'm simply going to just give you a panoramic view of what we will be learning in AMP 1 and AMP 2. Uh, this is not for you to memorize or anything. I'm just giving you a, a, a kind of like a preview from, from a movie, right? What you're going to learn. And it's going to get you overwhelmed and get you pumped, scared, or happy. So I don't know. <laughs> Either pumped because you really like this stuff and you want to learn it, scared because you feel overwhelmed, or happy because you're finally learning this stuff. So whatever it is, I hope you enjoy it. So the first thing that we're going to do in AMP1 is skin. Um, so these are some of the functions, protection, water retention, thermoregulation, vitamin D synthesis, cutaneous sensation, nonverbal communication. You know how, like if you're walking and somebody's behind you and you can sort of sense it? Well, we have that on our skin. We have these sensors, you know, we can feel. Um, so it's, it's amazing. The skin is an amazing organ. It is the largest organ, believe it or not, in the body. So we'll go over that. Next, we're going over... Come on, try to move to the next slide. There we go. Next slide, we're going to do skeletal system, also in AMP1, a boatload of bony landmarks, holes, divots, grooves, bones. So get ready for that. That's going to be the heart. This is going to be the greatest test, how much you can acquire in a short amount of time because we have only one to two weeks to learn this. So make sure you learn ahead if you need to. If you process slowly, start reading ahead. Okay, now let's keep going. The next slide is going to be all about muscles, and we will be doing it in AMP1. You're going to learn some of the muscles, but not all of them, so don't panic. There is quite a lot to learn, but we won't be teaching every single detail of every single muscle. Moving on. All right, the next thing, this is already AMP2. You'll be learning about the lymphatic system. Um, the lymphatic system is going to take up excess fluid that um, the arterial venous system can't handle. Um, it'll also detect pathogens. Um, it'll, it'll, it'll be an a intricate part of the immune system as well. We'll go over that in AMP2. Now, the next slide is going to show you uh, respiratory system. Without the respiratory system, we would not be alive. We need to convert uh, the oxygen and get it to um, all tissues and all cells of the body. And the way we do that is through our nose and uh, breathing through our nose and our mouth, preferably our nose, getting the oxygen to uh, where it needs to go. When we exhale, we get rid of our uh, carbon dioxide. All right, next slide, we will be going over, ah, urinary system. So urinary system is all the way at the end of AMP2. Um, we develop lots of waste products as we metabolize. This is what our kidneys do. There are other organs in the body that metabolize waste products as well, but your kidney is the main uh, station where a lot of the uh, filtration takes place. And we pick up things that we need uh, and recirculate it into the circulation. And things that we don't need, we filter out as the urine. All right. I'm going to keep going. Sometimes my PowerPoint slides freeze, like right now, and it's annoying. Ah, here we go. So this is basically your nervous system. We will be learning about nervous system in AMP1 towards the end. It's going to happen week 9, week 10, week 11. By week 12, we will be wrapping it up. Week 13, we'll be doing eye and ear. And week 14, you'll be taking the final. So it's bam, 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 one after another. 14 weeks of hell. No, I'm kidding. It'll be fine. As long as you stay organized and do your quizzes each week and um, follow my PowerPoints, follow, follow my YouTubes, come to virtual classroom, everything will be fine, despite Corona. <laughs> okay, so uh, what do we have here? 
endocrine system. Endocrine system is intricately uh, related to the nervous system because the nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, will detect um, fight or flight sympathetic, and that's going to affect the endocrine system, specifically the adrenal gland releasing epinephrine. Um, with chronic stress, it's going to release cortisol. Um, from the outer cortex of the adrenal gland. So you're going to learn about all about endocrine system and how it's related to uh, the ANS, the autonomic nervous system portion of the nervous system. Also to note that the endocrine system is also quite interrelated with the reproductive system because whatever the pituitary gland releases are these particular hormones, FSH and LH, which influence the testes and the ovaries. And we'll go over that when we get there. That'll be A and P2. Just get through A and P1. A and P2, like I said, endocrine system is mainly physiology. Although there is some anatomy, especially when it comes to learning about the blood vessels. And that is what you're going to see next here in this image, which let me show you. This is the circulatory system. The pump is the heart. You're going to learn first the heart the blood flow through the heart, then you're going to learn about the electrical system and how it causes contraction of the heart, which is directly controlled by, again, the nervous system, specifically the medulla controlling the heart rate, specifically uh, the vagus nerve maintaining a, a, a nice uh, regular rate and rhythm. 60 beats a minute is preferable. Anything below that is bradycardia. Anything above that... Um, way above that would be tachycardia. Uh, tachycardia is considered 100 beats per minute or up. All right, and then you've got the arteries in the systemic circulation sending uh, oxygenated blood to all tissue. Deoxygenated blood is, is returning back to the right side of the heart via the superior vena cava. This is the inferior vena cava. You can learn all about that in AMP2. All right, what do we have next? Um, digestive system. So in digestive system, we're going to learn from, from mouth to anus um, all the steps. And basically, the wave-like contractions start to move throughout um, the alimentary canal. Alimentary is spelled A-L-I-M-E-N-T-A-R-Y, alimentary canal. Um, so that goes from the mouth all the way to the anus. All right. Reproductive system. So reproductive system um, will be the second lecture in AMP2. So it won't be this semester. You'll be learning the male reproductive system and the female reproductive system, how it works. And most of you have had sex education. Well, you're going to get more of it, and you'll get Dr. Ruth. Um, I can't do that accent, but um, no joke. It will be interesting because we're going to learn all about how the hormones affect the growth of these sex hormones and the maintenance of sexual health throughout your lifetime. All right. And this is the female reproductive system. If you haven't seen one, well, here it is. And we'll go into way more detail when we do reproductive in A and B too. Of course, the mammary glands are part of it. Um, the breasts are, are simply um, a, a means to produce milk for the offspring. That's what it's for. All right. And here we just are going to look at multiple images, and I will be ending. Um, these images are images of the body. So um, we're going to look at these images. You're going to see so much here. I wanted to just delineate this, this fat that's over the greater omentum. This is a very huge connective tissue. This connective tissue is very important. Um, this is the connective tissue that... Uh, provides blood supply because as you can see we have arteries there. It also stores fat. So this is what causes our belly fat just so you know. And it sits on top and it's like a protective layer over all our visceral organs. And these are all involuntary smooth muscle type of organs. All the organs here have smooth muscle. I have to show you that because a lot of people say, well, what are you pointing to? That that I'm pointing to here is not fat. I'm pointing to what's called the greater omentum. All right. 
So again, I'm not going to belabor this point because the whole purpose of taking AMP 1 and 2 is to learn all of this. So I'll just start a little bit and give you a superficial, very cursory review of what we will be doing. In AMP 1, we'll learn about the where the thyroid gland is on our uh, human torso models. Unfortunately, we're online and we're not touchy-feely on ground to feel these uh, plastic models, but you will see me on my YouTube video uh, describing where everything is at. So there's your thyroid gland, the thyroid cartilage. You will have an assignment where you need to identify all these parts. Here's the superior vena cava. Here's the aortic arch. These are the. This is the right lung with the three lobes. This is the left lung. There's the heart. Here's the liver. Of course, this right here, the dome-shaped structure, is a smooth muscle called the diaphragm that delineates and separates out the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. Besides the liver, below it is the gallbladder. The liver mainly, it does a 20 million things, but one of the things it does is it makes bile, and the gallbladder stores the bile. This little uh, J-shaped structure, you can't see the whole J because it's hiding underneath uh, the diaphragm, but that's the stomach. And behind the stomach is the pancreas. This is the ascending colon on that uh, lower right quadrant moving up into the right upper quadrant, going across transverse, that's called the transverse colon, and going inferiorly, this is called the um, descending colon, and then behind the small intestine, which you can see here in the center, behind there, it's kind of like an S shape, and that S shape is literally sigmoid, S for sigmoid, and then it straightens out and goes straight down, that's the rectum, and then the opening is called the anus. Okay. Moving on, uh, more of the same. Um, this is where I can show you, oh, didn't mean to do that. Let me go back. This is where I can really show you um, the pancreas. There's the pancreas. If you take the stomach out, you're going to see the pancreas. If you take the stomach and everything else out, the small intestine, large intestine, you will see the, the kidneys right here. And then above it, you will see the adrenal gland. You can see the uh, inferior vena cava coming back to the heart and the aorta going away from the heart. This right here, you can see the uterus because this is a female and then right below the uterus is the bladder. All right, so these are just some things I wanted to point out. Again, you got the right bronchus, the left bronchus, the bronchioles, and the right lung, and here's the left lung. There's the aortic arch right here. This is the superior vena cava. All right. All right, so more of the same. I just want you to take a look at these on your own. Um, just briefly showing you all these pictures. Um, for the purposes of the test, you should know, again, uh, the omentum. And if you open up and take away the omentum and you open up the cavity and look inside, you'll see the small intestine. And the connective tissue that connects the small intestine together is called the mesenteric uh, mesentery. And the mesenteric artery and vein is going to provide uh, blood supply to, to the small intestine. And I hate to tell you this, but I will because I experienced it in residency. I saw it. When a really heavy smoker has atherosclerosis, plaque formation, it can clog up the mesenteric artery, and if it gets really, really bad, it causes necrosis of the small intestine, the tissue dies, and then it ruptures, and then the poop gets everywhere, and the guy or girl dies of sepsis, so horrible, horrible way to die. All right. Two more slides and we are done. So this is a sagittal cut, just showing you a sagittal cut of the male reproductive system on a cadaveric um, body here. This is a dead body. We say cadaveric because it's it's just a nicer way to say dead. Instead of dead, we say cadaveric. It's a cadaver. All right, and that's a sagittal cut of the penis. Sorry, guys. <laughs> and sagittal cut of the um, body, and you can see all the parts here. Here's the sigmoid. Remember, I said sigmoid, it curves. That's the lowest portion of the colon all right, because the colon, basically the large intestine is called the colon. You've got the ascending, transverse, descending, sigmoid, rectum, anus. All right, here comes the last slide. This was an hour and 18 minutes. So this would be the length of my class if I would be down on the ground teaching this class. And then, of course, now we would be looking at the human torso models. So I apologize we can't do that due to the pandemic. I will always keep this, though. I'll keep this uh, video uh, because I think it'll help people at home when they're studying. So this is a mid-sagittal cut. 
mid-sagittal cut of a female and you can see um, oh, guess what there's the uterus and this is the cervix I just wanted to point that out <clears throat> all right guess what we are done I do hope you enjoyed this video um, I hope that uh, this was very instructional I wish you luck this is your first lesson it's going to get way harder so get ready stay focused keep organized and keep studying bye all right, I'm going to stop this now.